It's a bit sparse, yeah. Yes? A question about the data analysis for the lab. Sure. Like, so again, I really like try to write a MATLAB script to like minimize S, but like I'm not very good at MATLAB. Uh -huh. And I was like reading the help manuals and really trying to do it, but I had already started the data analysis like with Excel, uh -huh. where I was literally like I have a column of just H values, yeah, and then like I just try to like look which H value produced the closest values to the measured temperatures. And then, like, in that range, started to see which, like, produced the smallest S. Okay. Which is, like, the best I could do. I, like, can still try to figure out how to write a MATLAB script, but I don't know, like, what, the, what, what yeah. we're really expecting. So, I mean, you're not required to do it in any specific software. You can solve for H however you want, yeah. uh, numerically. And yeah, you can definitely do it just by like kind of a guess and check type of thing, just like guessing a bunch of H values. Okay. Um, you can do it programmatically in Excel by using like goal seek, or you can do it in MATLAB by also guessing a bunch of H values and kind of like manually seeing which one minimizes it or writing a minimization function, however you want. Yeah, it's not, we're not expecting you to use a specific technique or program. It's just some are faster and or easier than others depending on what experience you have yeah um but yeah i mean if as long as you can pick a technique that you can come up with a reasonable answer for then yeah it doesn't have to be a specific thing because yeah i didn't know like how many decimal values like we're supposed yeah to i mean think three. about like what the values of h that you're usually given in problems right it's like either integer values or maybe like to a tenths place yeah so that yeah that's fine okay like to a, an integer value to like a one one tenths place yeah but i mean the idea was that you kind of minimize however you pick and then you kind of decide when you're gonna stop getting more and more you know getting closer and closer to the answer and then you just kind of say like okay i stopped here and this is why Cool. Yeah, I mean, like significant digits kind of thing, right? Sure. Yeah. What's the Excel operation? Um, goal seek, I think. Goals. Yeah. G-O-A-L. Yes. I don't think I've personally used it, but I've heard that it works for that type of thing. Yeah. All right, anything else? Okay. So last time we were talking about convection and boundary layers, velocity, and thermal boundary layers, um, and how we can kind of figure out what's going on in the boundary layer and use that to um, calculate values of the friction coefficient and therefore um, kind of the surface drag, and then also the um, convection coefficient h. So. <coughs> We talked about the fact that the boundary layer varies um, in the x-direction, it develops in the x-direction, um, and so it has a certain thickness in the y-direction. Um, so if you want to kind of figure out what the flow is in the boundary layer, you have to figure out kind of what x and y dimension you're in. So you have to think about both dimensions. But you also have to think about um, whether the flow is laminar or turbulent, and that's what we're going to talk about today. That's what we're going to start off talking about, at least. <clears throat> so you have both laminar and turbulent boundary layers. <clears throat> and the nature of the flow, whether it's laminar or turbulent, can have a really big impact on what the, um, what the friction and convection coefficients are. <coughs> so typically, we'll draw another kind of cartoon schematic here. Typically what you have when a ambient flow impacts a flat plate is you have initially an area of laminar flow upstream <coughs> 
and then you have this kind of transition region and then the flow becomes kind of fully turbulent. And each of these regions has kind of distinct characteristics that define it and that also change um, kind of the nature of the flow in the boundary layer. So for the laminar region, it's defined kind of by more ordered, ordered fluid where you can kind of pick out the streamlines of the flow. And the laminar boundary layer profile it's kind of more gradual. And then downstream of the laminar region, you have a transition region where you start to see kind of little hints of turbulence. And the flow starts to become a little bit more unsteady and it uh, actually, in this region, kind of varies with time. So sometimes it'll look laminar, sometimes it'll look turbulent. And then downstream of the transition region, let's say we've got laminar here. This is the transition. And then downstream of that, you've got kind of fully turbulent flow. So the flow right next to the surface is still fairly well ordered <coughs> and then away from the surface you start to have kind of these like vortices three-dimensional fluid motion and unsteady behavior and the turbulent boundary layer has a different kind of characteristic than the laminar boundary layer. So it tends to have a much sharper slope, really close to the surface. And then it's much more flat for the remainder. And it's much flatter in this region because you have turbulent mixing that tends to kind of smooth out the velocity <coughs> profile. So um, turbulence will kind of bring high velocity flow down into the lower parts of the boundary layer and vice versa. So that tends to even out the uh, flow a lot more. And because you have um, zero flow here and then kind of a higher flow up here, that leads to a much sharper slope or gradient really, really close to uh, the surface. So we'll say up here we've come back to free stream. I'm just going to label the diagram a little bit. We've got our x direction. This is called x sub c which is the critical X, so that's the distance downstream of the leading edge where the transition to turbulence begins. This is the laminar region. The transition zone. And then past that is turbulent flow. And so we're talking about X and Y. So U is the um, flow velocity in the X direction and V is the flow velocity in the Y direction. And then finally, we'll define three regions within the turbulent boundary layer that have distinct properties. So really, really close to the surface, you have the viscous sublayer. And we'll write down what the properties of each of these layers are. Then just above that, you have another thin layer 
which is the buffer layer. So viscous sublayer, then the buffer layer, and then the majority of the boundary layer is going to be turbulent. So this is the turbulent zone. So in the laminar region, as we said, the fluid is highly ordered. In the transition, you start to have a conversion to turbulence. and the conditions are time dependent, kind of changing between looking like laminar flow to looking like turbulent flow. And then we have a turbulent region. So turbulent flow is highly irregular, it's inherently unsteady, You have random kind of three-dimensional motion. And you have velocity and pressure fluctuations. It's really difficult to fully describe turbulent flow, so typically when you write out the equations for turbulent flow, you talk about it in terms of like a mean velocity, so with the U over bar. And then we said it has three sublayers. So the viscous sublayer. <coughs> which because it's so close to the surface, you tend to have kind of a slower, more ordered fluid, which looks more like a laminar fluid. And so you have <coughs> diffusion dominating. So heat transfer is occurring primarily by kind of the mode that is dominant for conduction. And you have a velocity profile that's nearly linear. And typically has a larger slope than the velocity profile at the surface in a laminar flow. <coughs> Then we mentioned there's a buffer layer between the viscous sublayer and the turbulent region. And in the buffer layer, you kind of have equal parts diffusion and turbulent mixing. So diffusion and turbulent mixing are comparable. And by turbulent mixing, I mean kind of this um, random three-dimensional motion of like large packets of fluid that distribute both velocity and thermal energy kind of evenly throughout the top layer of the flow. Then you have the turbulent zone. Where turbulent mixing dominates. 
clear so far? So as we mentioned earlier, and I want to draw a little bit more attention to it, the laminar and turbulent velocity profiles are fairly distinct. And we'll draw them out here kind of a little bit more in detail. And the differences between them that contribute to the difference in the velocity gradient at the surface <coughs> causes differences in um, the friction coefficient and the convection coefficient. So it's really important to know if you're trying to look at a plate, for example, and figure out what the H is, it's important to know if you're in the laminar zone or the turbulent zone, or if you're looking at an average H over the entire plate, how much of it is laminar and how much of it is turbulent. So you can properly account for that in your calculation. So the laminar boundary layer, like we said, kind of grows more gradually. And the turbulent boundary layer kind of a very sharp transition, sharp kind of linear transition up to a much flatter profile. And there's all sorts of advantages and disadvantages to having laminar versus turbulent boundary layers. And there's a lot of research being done actually on flow control and kind of figuring out how to intentionally choose a laminar or a turbulent boundary layer based on what your application is um, and kind of specifically control the flow such that you can manipulate the boundary layer to kind of get the drag or the mixing or the heating or whatever um, conditions you want. So like we said, the turbulent flow is often described by its mean since it is really challenging to describe fully. So that's the U bar. So kind of one of the big takeaways from this is that this velocity profile at the surface, Y equals zero for a laminar flow tends to be smaller than the velocity gradient at the surface of a turbulent flow. And if you remember our definition of the shear stress, tau sub s, which depends directly on the velocity gradient at the surface, this tells us that the shear stress in a laminar flow is going to be smaller than the shear stress in a turbulent flow in general. So tau sub s laminar is less than tau sub s turbulent. <clears throat> so in order to calculate whether we're in the laminar or turbulent zone or how much of our plate has a laminar or turbulent boundary layer, we need to know where this transition from laminar to, from laminar to turbulence occurs and why it occurs. So we'll say transition to turbulence. So the transition to turbulence is typically caused by a triggering mechanism, which could be like a small disturbance in the flow. And that could come from kind of just tiny oscillations that are in the free stream or some surface roughness, some imperfection in the surface um, or kind of small surface vi vibrations. And then, you know, like a perfectly controlled lab environment, you can you know, manipulate the flow such that it remains laminar for much longer than it would normally. But in real situations, your something is going to cause a small disturbance in, disturbance in the flow 
and it has the potential to cause a transition to turbulence. So we'll say these are caused by small flow disturbances, or the transition to turbulence is caused by small flow disturbances. And these don't necessarily trigger a transition to turbulence, but they can, so they can be either attenuated in the direction of the flow, so the disturbances are damped out in the direction of the flow, or they are um, kind of amplified in the direction of the flow. And if they're amplified, that's when you end up having a transition to turbulence. And that all depends on the Reynolds number of the flow. So. Disturbances can be attenuated or amplified. If they're amplified, they can cause a transition to turbulence. And this is all determined by the Reynolds number. So this should be familiar from fluids, if you remember, and this is going to be R sub x, so here we're talking about a characteristic length in terms of the kind of x position, and it's rho, here the characteristic velocity is the free stream velocity, so u infinity, x, so your position along the plate, over mu, which is the dynamic viscosity. And we'll talk about kind of the physical meaning of our dimensionless parameters a little bit later, but this is, you can think of as the ratio of inertial to viscous forces. So you have kind of U infinity, so the free stream flow here and the viscosity here. So you can think about if the Reynolds number is really low, then you'll have a highly kind of viscous flow or the viscous forces dominate over the inertial forces. And so you could think about why maybe a flow with larger viscous forces might damp out attenuations or damp out disturbances in the flow, attenuate disturbances in the flow. Whereas if you have a flow with larger inertial forces and kind of lower viscosity, a high Reynolds number, which from fluids you should know is, tends to be more associated with turbulent flow, that would tend to amplify disturbances in the flow rather than damp them out and cause a transition to turbulence. Does that kind of make sense intuitively? Think about kind of more viscous forces damping out disturbances, inertial forces amplifying them. Okay, so we'll say small Reynolds number tends to attenuate disturbances and then the flow tends to remain lam laminar. Whereas if you have a large Reynolds number or larger Reynolds number It amplifies disturbances. And the flow transitions to turbulence. 
And for flow over a flat plate, basically someone has done enough experiments that we, um, that they've come up with this kind of critical Reynolds number. So the X location at where transition from laminar to turbulent flow tends to occur. So for flow over a flat plate, this critical Reynolds number, so Reynolds X comma C is equal to rho U infinity X sub C, so the critical X location where along the plate the transition will occur. And that's given as 5 times 10 to the fifth. <clears throat> this is a pretty important result, right? Because if you're trying to calculate the average or spatially average convection coefficient over a plate, and you know some of it's laminar and some of it's turbulent, and the properties are going to change based on if it's laminar or turbulent, you need to be able to break up your calculation into these two regions. And so you can, given the properties of the flow, you can calculate where this critical X location is and figure out how much of the flow is laminar and for how much of it the boundary layer is turbulent. This is for fluids? Yes. Yeah. So uh, the question was if this is for all fluids. And it, yeah, it applies across different fluid types, um, different flow velocities. Just has to be over a flat plate. So just, um, we're talking, kind of focusing primarily on the velocity boundary layer, but similar things apply to the thermal boundary layer. So the thermal boundary layer in a turbulent flow looks different than it does in a laminar flow, and it's very similar to the velocity profile. So we'll just kind of, instead of drawing it all out again for the thermal boundary layer, we'll just note that turbulent boundary layers also cause larger temperature gradients at the surface. So turbulent boundary layers also cause larger temperature gradients at the surface. for the same reason as they did for with the velocity gradients. We basically have turbulent mixing that causes the thermal boundary layer profile to be flatter, and then that causes a kind of sharper transition in the sublayer, close to the surface. So that's going to give you partial T, partial Y. So how our temperature profile is changing in the Y direction, so normal to the surface at the surface location in a laminar flow is less than that in a turbulent flow. And just like with the shear stress, um, last week we saw how the convection coefficient was directly related to the temperature profile. So H in a laminar flow is generally going to be smaller than H in a turbulent flow. And this is kind of reinforcing how the convection coefficient really does vary spatially. And we've just kind of been approximating it as uniform over a solid. So we either have to kind of calculate it at each X location and deal with it that way or take like a spatial average and kind of calculate the average properties over an entire surface. Okay, so the approach we're going to take for calculating 
these properties, the primarily the convection coefficient, is we, we will write out the boundary layer equations. So also should be familiar from fluids, just the conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. Um, Navier-Stokes equations, we're just writing them kind of under the assumptions that apply in the boundary layer. And then we'll go through and non-dimensionalize them to pull out some important dimensionless parameters that will end up being really powerful tools for calculating the convection coefficient across kind of different surfaces and different geometries in different fluids of velocity, different velocity and length scales. Okay. Questions so far? So we'll start with the boundary layer equations. So we'll set up um, kind of our, just like we do typically when we're applying a general equation to a very specific um, situation, we're going to set up what our assumptions and our simplifications are, and then we're going to give the resulting equations for those assumptions and simplifications. So like always, keep in mind the restrictions that we're putting on these equations, and then always think if you're applying them. You know, is this a situation where the assumptions are applicable? Okay, so we have a flow with coexisting velocity and temperature gradients. I'm just going to say U and T gradients. The flow is continuous, so at each point, the laws of conservation of mass, momentum, and energy apply. And we will apply these laws to a differential control volume within the flow. So these laws are applied to a differential control volume, CV, within the flow. And that's kind of the distinction between, you may have seen these equations written in differential form or integral form. And the difference is in differential form, you're applying them to kind of a differential volume element within the flow. Whereas in integral form, you're looking at kind of an entire large macroscopic um, control volume where you have kind of control surfaces across the entire flow. So we're going to be looking at the differential version of the equations. All right, lots of assumptions. This is going to allow us to write the equations in a much more simpler manner than if we were to write them out fully. So we're going to look at laminar flow, steady, so it does not vary in time, two-dimensional, incompressible, We're going to assume that the flow has constant properties. We're going to neglect body forces. 
So that's any sort of like force that acts over the, vo the kind of the volume of the fluid. So anything like gravity or like an electromagnetic field, anything like that. We're neglecting body forces. And no internal energy generation. So the flow isn't reacting. There's not any sort of electrical current passed through it. Yes? So with the constant properties, uh, what properties are we saying? Is that like uh, density, viscosity, right? So there is no, no, we, are, we still have viscous flow, right? Yes. Yeah, we're assuming it's viscous. Okay, right. But like constant viscosity, density. Right. Uh, anything else? Yeah. Um, Viscosity and density are the two big ones. There are also a couple of uh, kind of dimensionless properties that we'll uncover later on. Um, and so they, they do still vary with temperature, right? But basically this is saying that the properties of the fluids are not varying spatially um, or with time. Okay. Yeah. So we can say it's constant spatially and with, with time which is kind of inherent in the steady assumption, but we can go ahead and specifically call it out. All right, so we made a bunch of assumptions. We're also gonna make some simplifications based on the fact that we're in the boundary layer. So the boundary layer is really thin, right, compared to the rest of the fluid, kind of the free stream part of the flow. And there's a pretty significant change in the velocity and the temperature, as we saw, between the surface and the free stream flow. And that occurs in a really small kind of amount of space. So we know that the boundary layer develops in the x direction, and it's also changing in the y direction. But we're going to say that gradients in the x direction, even though they exist, are much smaller than the y direction. So we're basically going to neglect x direction gradients. And that's a simplification based on the fact that we're just in the boundary layer that we're going to make. So that's second partial derivative of u with respect to x is much, much less than u with respect to y. And the same thing for the temperature gradient. So we're just saying that the temperature is changing much less quickly in the x direction than it is in the y direction. So this is telling us basically that, okay, shear stress and conduction heat flux in the x directions are negligible. That's what these things determine but we're still definitely considering them in the y direction. Okay, the boundary layer is also, so because it's thin, we can approximate the pressure distribution in the x direction in the boundary layer to be equal to the pressure distribution in the free stream. So because the boundary layer is so thin, you can just assume that kind of the pressure is uniform throughout the entire flow, including the very thin boundary layer at the surface. So that's saying partial P partial X is approximately equal to, and we're switching to a full derivative here, which is just to say that the pressure distribution in the free stream the pressure in the free stream only varies with x, and we're going to take that to be equal to the pressure variation in the boundary layer. So partial p partial x is approximately equal to dp infinity dx. This is really convenient because this dp dx in the free stream can be determined kind of by a, a separate independent consideration of just the free stream flow. 
So you don't have to figure out what it is based on kind of the boundary layer problem that you have. So typically when we talk about this quantity, we'll assume that it's just known from some kind of independent investigation of what the free stream is doing. So we'll say this can be determined from the free stream. Given these assumptions and simplifications, we can finally write down the resulting differential equations. So the first, we'll say resulting equations. Conservation of mass. Remember, we're only talking about two-dimensional flow. So partial u partial x plus partial v partial y equals zero. And it's good to have kind of an intuitive understanding of what all of the terms mean. So this on the left hand side is the net outflow of mass. And then for a steady flow, that has to be equal to zero, right? So you don't have mass accumulating within your control volume or a mass depletion within the control volume for steady flow. So that sums to zero for a steady flow. Okay, momentum is next. Conservation of momentum. That one is U partial U partial X plus V partial U partial Y. equals one over rho, sorry, negative one over rho. Negative one over rho, our pressure distribution, dp infinity dx plus, this is where you gotta be careful with the nomenclature that's new viscosity, different from V. Partial squared U over partial Y squared. So this is the kind of net rate at which x momentum leaves the control volume due to advection so just flow in and out of the control volume the mass that's flowing in and out has some energy associated with it, some momentum associated with it, and that's the net rate at which it's leaving the control volume due to advection. Yes? What is the relationship between <coughs> the two viscosities? Okay. Um, so kinematic viscosity, nu, is dynamic divided by density. That's right. um, yeah, so 
mu is, sorry, nu is mu divided by rho. If you get to choose, I always use this one because then you only have to look up one value. Okay, this one is the net pressure force. And this last term is net force due to viscous shear stress. All right, I think we have time to write down our conservation of energy equation. So U partial T partial X plus V partial T partial Y is alpha partial squared t partial y squared plus nu over c sub p partial u partial y quantity squared. So this alpha that keeps popping up, um, except when you're talking about radiation, is the thermal diffusivity that we talked about in like the first week. So just like above, this is going to be the net rate <coughs> at which thermal energy leaves the control volume. Due to advection. This is the inflow, the second term, or the first term on the right hand side, is the inflow of thermal energy <coughs> due to y direction conduction. And then the final term is viscous dissipation. And that refers to basically the damping out of motion, small motion, by viscosity. And it's typically neglected for laminar flow. Turbulent flow, it's significant, but for laminar flow, it's often neglected. And we will neglect it later on. So just like with any differential equation, if you have proper boundary conditions, you can solve these for the velocity profile. So if you look, they're all kind of functions of u and v, u and v, and temperature. So if you have the proper boundary conditions, you can solve them for the velocity distribution and the temperature distribution. And then you can solve for you know, the shear stress, the friction coefficient, the convection coefficient, all those things. Um, and it's interesting to note that the conservation of mass and momentum equations um, do not depend on temperature. So it's just U and V. So they can basically be solved independently without knowledge of the temperature distribution. But then to solve for the temperature distribution, you have to know what U and V are. So this one is coupled to these two, but these are not coupled to this one. Okay, so we'll 
talk a little bit more conceptually for a couple days and then we'll get into actually calculating how we calculate H and C sub F and all that.